Hello. If you have a Bible, we're going to be in Genesis chapter 45 at the end of that chapter as we're getting into chapter 46. Again, we're reaching the conclusion close to of the life of Joseph, a colorful life. And tonight, or today, whenever you see this, I want us to focus on the beginning of a great reunion. Again, the beginning of a great reunion. Do you have a family reunion? And if so, what's that like? Our family on my mother's side, my, my father's side, if my grandparents have passed away and it's just uh, an aunt and it seems like when the matriarch and the patriarch pass away, that kind of goes away with uh, traditions and so forth. But anyways, my mother's side, uh, still we meet together and we meet two times a year if we can around the 4th of July, as well as around Christmas time, uh, we come together. In the sake of my grandfather and grandmother, uh, to be with them. But when we come together, we have a lot of talking, a lot of laughing, a lot of noise with our family and the size of our family. And there is a lot of eating. If you come to one of our family reunions, if you leave hungry, something is wrong with you. There's so much food. I mean, tons of food. And it is so good. Oh, my goodness. It's just the best food and coming together. And it's just a great thing. And it's an event that it's, it's just a great memory. It's, it's, it's building great memories and conversations and playing games and laughing and just being together and it's just a wonderful occasion and yet I have that thought in my mind when I think of family reunions you have your own family reunion but to me when I think about a family reunion to me it's 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 a great hint and a taste if you will of the greatest reunion that is yet to come I'm talking about the reunion where we are able to be with the ones who have gone on before us to be with them and to dwell with them forever i'm thinking about those great men and women that we have read about and studied and heard sermons and lessons about from old and new and just thinking about being with them and to, 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 to ask them questions and to to dwell with again with them forever and yet to be with the one who came and lived and died for us to be with him to be with God forever imagine that moment for a moment it's a lot of moments imagine that for a minute and thinking about that I don't know about you but it's a beautiful thought it's a wonderful thought to think about to be with God and to dwell with him forever to see him as he is and to be with those that are the people of God, the church, and the glorious men and women who have served and lived this life and have gone through. If you recall last week, Joseph revealed his nature, who he was, his identity. I am Joseph. And he reminded his brothers, even though it was that they meant evil, even though that they are the ones that sold him, into slavery that it was God that brought him into Egypt and Joseph had saw he saw that and he realized that and he was trying to convey to the brothers even though it was their devious plans it was God's wondrous greater plan that he was able to see and so when he revealed himself and he shared that he went first to Benjamin and he wept and hugged him and was there embraced him and then he went and he kissed all his other brothers and he wept over them as well a beautiful scene but yet it was joseph that wanted to be reunited with his father jacob knowing that his father was still alive knowing that jacob was back home and he wanted jacob to be back with them and so this begins as we see and our lesson tonight, starting this great family reuniting and this great family reunion. 
we'll look at the first part of this uh, this evening or today. The first point that I want to share with you is Pharaoh's acceptance. We think about it, Joseph, again, even though he was the fabric of Egypt now because he had been there for so long, he was still a Hebrew by birth. And his brothers were Hebrews as well. But Pharaoh's acceptance of them it shows Joseph's character and his reputation among the Egyptians. If you look with me in Genesis chapter 45, beginning in verse 16, it reads, Now the report of it was heard in Pharaoh's house, saying, Joseph's brothers have come. So it pleased Pharaoh and his servants well. Pharaoh said to Joseph, Say to your brothers, Do this, load your animals and depart, go to the land of Canaan, bring your father and your households and come to me, and I will give you the best of the land of Egypt, and you will eat the fat of the land. Now you are commanded, do this. Take carts to the land of Egypt for your little ones and your wives. Bring your father and come. Also, do not be concerned about your goods, for the best of all the land of Egypt is yours. During the seven years of plenty prior to the seven years of famine, which they were continuing to be in at this particular time, God had given Joseph the guidance and the wisdom to understand the dream. And it was through Joseph's obedience to what God had revealed to him that put into action and working in those seven years and building in and storing in those great storehouses the grain that was plenty for their years of lean, years of famine. The great rich Nile and the great silt that it provided in the rich farmland that they were able to farm during those seven years to provide for them not only during that time, but also what would come afterwards. As Pharaoh had heard about Joseph's brothers coming, it noticed it pleased him. It pleased him because of Joseph, not because he knew his brothers and he loved his brothers, but because of who Joseph was. And he wanted Joseph to convey to them, to them to go back home with these great carts, to carry with them goods, to carry with them abundance of things, because it was a precursor of what would be provided for them when they come back with the father, Joseph's father. They would have the best of the land of Egypt, the best of what the land of Egypt could offer would be theirs. That's something that would Pharaoh would offer for his family. That's something that Pharaoh would offer his inner circle and their families. And that's not anything that Pharaoh would have offered to a foreigner, but he did for Joseph. And that it brings to me what I think Joseph's reputation, a man of integrity, a man of good works. And to me, even though it doesn't mention this directly, we can see this indirectly by the way Pharaoh was dealing with Joseph's family. Reputation is an important thing, even in today's time. And we see that play out in Jesus' teaching and even in the qualifications of a church leader. But I think it should be a qualification for any Christian that we are people of our words. Let our yes be yes and our no be no. Let our light shine before others. Let us be salt of the earth. The Lord's church today needs to be a, a church, a group of people, a body of believers that have a reputation, that are people of integrity, that those who are outside have nothing evil to say of us because of our conduct, because of our words, because of our action. And to me, I think that's a point for us to consider as we look at Joseph then, as we think about God's people today. It's clear that the type of reputation that Joseph had didn't come overnight. The type of reputation and the type of integrity that he demonstrated among the Egyptians was not something that happened within a week or a month. It was something that he showed over time. And for us as well, when we are deep-rooted in our communities, in our neighborhoods, in our workplaces, it's through those times that we're there and establishing relationships that what we show 
on a day-to-day -day basis with our consistency is so vital and is so important for us. Our second point that I want us to look at with this lesson is Joseph, Joseph's provisions. If you go as we continue with Genesis chapter 45, beginning in verse 21, then the sons of Israel did so, and Joseph gave them carts according to the command of Pharaoh. And he gave them provisions for the journey. He gave them all of them, to each man, changes of garments. But to Gen Benjamin, he gave 300 pieces of silver and five changes of garments. And he sent to his father these things, ten donkeys loaded with the good things of Egypt, ten female donkeys loaded with grain, bread, and food for his father for the journey. And he sent his brothers away, and they departed. And he said to them, See that you do not become troubled along the way. When you think about this particular text here, what Joseph says at the end is interesting, and we'll look at that in just a moment. He sends Joseph's brothers away with plenty in a land, not only in Egypt, but outside of Egypt, that was famished. People that were hungry. People that were with little because of what the famine had done during these times, years that they were facing. Yet they had all that they needed. They had more. If I may borrow the words of David, their cup runneth over. Now, because directly what Joseph had done for them and Pharaoh had done, but more importantly what God and how God was involved in all of this. Joseph tells his brothers in verse 24, See that you do not become troubled along the way. What that means is don't get into any arguments with among yourselves on your journey. Joseph knew his brothers. Even though he had been removed from them for 20 plus years, he still knew who they were. He still grew up and was fully familiar with his family, with their personalities, with who they were as individuals. And even though we're removed from this particular time, human nature hasn't really changed, has it? When it comes to things, when it comes to stuff, and if one has more than the others, and especially when it comes to family, we can see that arguments can easily, easily happen. If it's not fair, if it's not divided evenly, then someone's feelings are hurt, someone is upset with the other. And we could see this really play out when it comes to, I know this is off the topic, off the subject rather, topic rather, but when it comes to inheritance, one person gets more than what we think, one person gets something different we think is more than the other, and families get upset, and there's argument, there's fighting, there's quarreling, and it's, it's just a mess. And Joseph wanted to make sure they understood that there would be no troubling among them in their journey back. They don't get into an argument. Because with Benjamin, because they shared the same mother in the, in the, in the relationship that Joseph had with Benjamin, he gave him more than what he gave his brothers. Now, they all had plenty. They weren't going to go hungry. They weren't going to go without but he gave Benjamin 300 shekels of silver and five changes of, of clothing, of new garments. And he didn't want them to fight with Benjamin because of what he had compared to what they had. And he wanted to make sure with that, and he commanded them not to do that. We come to Jacob, and really Jacob takes up the majority of this lesson. I love Jacob's response because he didn't know what was happening in Egypt. He wasn't involved in these conversations. He didn't know that Joseph had revealed himself. Joseph was dead in his heart. As he thought, Joseph was dead. Verse 25 and 26, And they went up to Egypt, out of Egypt and came to the land of Canaan to Jacob their father. And they told him, saying, Joseph is still alive. He is governor over all the land of Egypt. Jacob's heart stood still because he did not believe them. Joseph's alive. He's living. 
He was stunned. He didn't believe them. You see, in Jacob's heart and mind, Joseph had been buried long ago. He had given up hope of ever seeing him again. So it's not surprising to see Jacob's initial uh, reaction. He didn't believe them. But when he looked and saw what they had brought with them, the wagons, the donkeys, the goods, the abundance of goods, his spirit was revived. Let's stop there for a moment. Let's imagine Jacob and being in his shoes for a moment. For him realizing in that moment that who was dead, that he thought was dead, was now alive. I think about families who believe their loved ones are dead. They've gone on to serve our country in a noble way in fighting. They get captured. You think they're as good as dead and then over the years they come back. Imagine what that must be like for those families. Imagining Jacob he was revived in his inner spirit, but that change, emotion, from thinking one thing and the inter completely different 180 of seeing something much different. Well, they pack their things, they get ready, and they begin traveling back to Egypt because Jacob wants to be with his son. He wants to see his son that he thought was dead who is now alive, but Jacob does something that is brilliant wisdom on his part in chapter 46 beginning in verse 1 so Israel took his journey with all that he had and came to Beersheba offered sacrifices to God of his father Isaac then God spoke to Israel in the vision of the night and said Jacob Jacob and he said here I am and he said I am God the God of your father do not fear to go down to Egypt for I will make you a great nation there and I will go down with you to Egypt, and I will also surely bring you up again. And Joseph will put his hands on your eyes. As I mentioned, Jacob or Israel was older. He was wiser. He had learned some very difficult lessons throughout the years. He wanted to be sure that God was involved in this big decision. They were uprooting. They were leaving the land that which God had promised them to go to a foreign land. Would God be pleased? You see, land tied them to a promise that God gave to them. It was a part of their identity as God's chosen people. And so when he came to Beersheba, he stopped there. And he stopped there for a good reason. He had he built an altar, and he offered sacrifices, and he waited for God's response. He wanted God's blessing to be involved in this move, this change, if you will, for their family and for God's people. And God spoke to Israel. He spoke to Jacob. He reminded him who he was, as God is. I am God. I'm the God of your father. Do not fear. I will make you a great nation there. This is a major moment in Jacob's family, but also in the family of God. God didn't give Jacob all the details. Jacob would be long gone before God, before they would be a great nation and God would deliver them. In fact, some over 400 years before we see Moses coming back and the plagues taking place. But that's another story. All we know is, and all Jacob knew, is that God would bless them and God can make them a great nation. Which shows us that God is the God of this world. He's the God of the universe. God is not defined to a particular place. God is not defined to our church buildings. God is not defined to a, a certain point or time. He is the God of all things. But yet the lesson is so important for us to conclude with. Making a big decision, especially making the decision to move from point A to point B. Well, it can make us insecure. Pulling up roots in one place and putting them down in another place. 
well, it can make us fearful. It can make us second-guess ourselves. We don't know if this is the right move for us. We don't know if this is something that God wants us to do or not. And so wise here to learn from Jacob and what he does here. He wants God to be involved in this move. He wants God's blessing in this move. We should pause and understand the value of listening to God. I will say this, God's will is going to be done whether you're here or there or wherever you may go. His will is not defined by the moment in the place where you're at and when you leave, it's, His will is not going to be done. His will will be done. But we do want God's blessing. We want God to be glorified. We want God to be involved in every aspect of our life. And taking the time to pray and to wait and to pause and to not rush. To consider what that we want God involved in all of this. Well, that's a great lesson that Jacob shows us. I want to stop there and close and thinking about that. When we make decisions, when we make big choices of our life, do we involve God? Do we take the time to pray? Do we consider Him and wanting Him to bless this decision, bless this choice, bless this move that we're making, whatever it may be, whether it's geographically, whether it's with the job, whatever transition that we're in in our life? Have we invited God to be a part of that? I think that's so important. And Jacob, Israel, shows us that so wisely. I know that he wants to rush back. He wants to see Joseph. But he wants God to be glorified and he wants God to be involved. And it comes down to that. It's about God. And even though this is a story that's told in Genesis, it's still the same point for us today in the 21st century. God needs to be glorified in us in whatever we do. God needs to be involved. And it's always about God. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you. We thank you for loving us. We thank you for being so good to us. And I ask that you will be with us. Bless us. Thank you so much for loving us and bringing us to this point in our lives. We ask your blessing to be with us in whatever decisions that we have. We pray that we will consider you in all things, that whatever we do in word and deed, we will do all in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We are grateful and thankful for the many blessings that you blessed us with, and we are especially thankful for the gift of salvation. We thank you for being a part of the spiritual body of Christ. We thank you for all that you do, and you are still in control. You are still God. Your, your will continues to be done, and we thank you for that. We pray all these things in your son's precious name.